intro be gone. Pow! Booyah! Other words that sound like explosions <laughs> or harsh things. I'm really with it today, aren't I? This is not going to be good. This it, is... It's going to be great because we're both out of our minds. <laughs> That's right. I just got out of the. I didn't. When you took a shower, I went and I pulled a cat out of a tree. I had to rescue a cat. That's awesome. Isn't that cool? It's a complete lie. <laughs> but that's what I told everybody when we were late. Hello, everybody. Happy Saturday. Welcome to whatever the hell this is. <laughs> whatever the hell this is. <laughs> I like that. That's the new show name. It's... Hey, we're all about the truth here, That's boys right. and girls. That's right. Hey, everybody. You're already talking amongst yourselves. Arthur, uh, how you doing? We've got Jim Coleman. We've got... Oh, we have uh, uh, Mark. Mark's asking who did the thumbnail illustration. Let's give Chick some, uh, some oh. props. So, uh, in the 80s... In the early 80s, I had a band called The Pencils, and uh, we I played around really L.A. I love that name. We, had, we, had, we played around L.A. and, and uh, like original music. It was a quartet, two guitars, bass drums. And um, uh, one of the guys in the band, uh, the other guitar player, uh, just... As the band evolved, we decided to become a trio. We stayed really good friends, but he was no longer in the band. But when we were doing the band and when we were promoting, he was doing all of our, um, all of our flyers and stuff. Mm. And he did a great job of that. And uh, so later on, um, <clears throat> he went to work for some company doing graphic illustrations and advertising and media and stuff like that. So we all stayed in touch. So um, he goes by the name of Chick. Singer, <laughs> which was his stage Serious? name, which is his stage name. Oh, we were, that's we, brilliant! Yeah, and uh, so <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> um, so our good friend Chick, who uh, he he edits the manuals, he does all the illustrations in the manuals, he does all the um, I didn't know that either. All the 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 mockups for the product when we uh, when we design a new product. We flesh it out on with rough drawings and. Um, That's him too. Yeah. Damn, he's the wolf. Yeah, he is, and he and he does, he does it. Um, you ever seen the, the? He's so fast. He's ridiculous. He's he became a whiz at it, um, and he doesn't live in California anymore. But he's milliseconds away by internet. So. Um, when we're working on manuals, there's drafts and drafts. It goes back 45 times before a manual is complete. But for the show, when we need an illustration, it's usually like because Joe and I talk a couple of days before the show and go, you know who would be bitching? And then would be if we had this really cool sort of animated looking sketch of tubes dancing on a hot dance floor and that, and that heat and energy going in, into the power load. Wouldn't that be bitching? And... Uh, he goes, yeah, too bad we don't have any time. I scratched that on a piece of paper. Oh, yeah. Actually, we should... I sh can I show that? Yeah, I, I scratched... I sketched out the idea on a piece of paper, and I emailed it to him. And I said, I need this today. And, uh, and he emailed me back, okay. All right. All right, let me see if I can do this. And then two hours later... Uh, the so... Yeah, that's, this? that's what I sent him. <laughs> I, I scratched it on a, I, in, in one minute, I scratched that down on a post-it. Became. And, and that became, the next, that was the that. second draft. First draft was a little different, but the, the, so that was the second draft. And so I, we had that done by that same evening. So that's what, that's what a wizard chick singer is. That dude is such he a does dude. The, you've seen the, the. The Ilroy, my alter ego, the the punk guy with the mohawk, he did that. The the skull T-shirt, the the skull guy, that's uh, him too. <laughs> Damn, he did that. He's the bestest. I, I go to him and I go, he, here's what's in my head, and he takes that stuff very literally. So I have to be very careful what I say because I, 
I have to not make it too complicated. I just have to get the raw idea out to him so he can visualize it. And then usually what I get back is what it looks like the net effect of somebody just like prying my head open and going, oh, I see what you're looking for. Yeah. So, you and, know. And, and the one thing that I've had to say, because uh, actually the last season of The Malcontents, we had, I don't know, two or three shows that he did uh, the, the artwork for the little thumbnails. And um, the unfortunate thing that I found was that, like, he's doing them so fast, but they're still really detailed. Yeah. And he'll, he'll put these incredible little, almost like inside jokes in there. And you can't, it, it's hard to grasp them within the thumbnail or even on Instagram or something like that. So um, I think with this one, I remember saying to you, just if you can get them to make it like not as detailed, like not as good <laughs> as he normally does, because the dude yeah. is just a whiz. That's what I did. I just said, look, you don't need to spend a lot of time fleshing this out. Just like. Just, just the be just the basic. Man, concept. is he good? And then, of course, the other part of the extra detail that that occurs is that when I get the draft, then I go, you know, it'd be great if, and then, and then, so I resisted the temptation. There was just one change I wanted, and I went, okay, <coughs> Joe. I'm hearing Joe. Don't go overdo it. <laughs> yelling at, in, in the back of my head. So, anyway, thanks for noticing that. That was that was cool, and that's fun. I'm choking on I, this. I, you're choking on your Do you drink. hear that? <laughs> that was so cool. I sound like a Death Star droid. <laughs> what are you, choking on whiskey? I am. <laughs> it got me good. We can't just have a show. We have to have Joe choking on whiskey. <laughs> not supposed to choke on whiskey. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things I'm not supposed to do what I do anyway. <laughs> what am I drinking here anyway? Eric brought some. I don't know. This is... Uh, Jefferson's oh, yeah. Ocean, that's, aged at sea. Yeah, that's the stuff that, that goes around the world on a ship. And what? You don't know about that? You might have talked about it, but yeah. do you know the story? Uh, there's several different variations of it, and they go, on, they, they go in casks, and they're shipped around the world in shipping containers on freighters. So they have different... The northern hemisphere, the southern hemisphere, they have so different... So what the hell am I drinking then? What hemisphere? I, uh, Erico says that it has something to do with look at the Voyage back of Voyage 23. Yeah, Voyage 23, that's what it is. So yeah. then I'd have to look up what Voyage 23 that's means? That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, ooh, so it's like a, uh, you need the, the secret decoder ring. Yeah, remember that episode we team. did with the, with the black whiskey, the blackened whiskey? Yeah, the blackened whiskey. That, yeah. yeah, you had to... It, with the it, guy it, from Whistlepig and Metallica? Yeah, well, he had, you had to have the set list, you know, to know what the expression's oh, about. There was because, the set list and the barrels. Because the, when they were well, aging the whiskey, yeah. they were blasting the casks yeah, with Metallica playlists. A specific playlist, yeah. Yeah, and Amanda, of course I'm doing whiskey wrong. I mean, what, what don't I do wrong? <laughs> well, at least you have at least you have a woman reminding you what you're doing wrong, and that's a good thing. <laughs> that's it's very important. It is. I mean, come on, guys. Guys, really? Is not is not what we need? Is not what we need? And then, yes, <laughs> yes, you're right. I'm doing it wrong. I'll try better next time. Yeah. <laughs> Amanda, yes, you are useful, especially when you tell us stories about drinking the what was it? The, the snake, snake, the yeah. snake, something. The, is the it, snake was it wine or was from it from Southeast Asia? Yeah, was it was it wine or was it a hard liquor that had the snake in it? Oh, oh man, that I think it was. I think you said it was me. some kind of wine. Yeah. Drake Passage, the only place where the container is likely to notice that it is aboard a ship. I don't what. I don't even know what Drake Passage is. Isn't that the north, the which the, is the, the north pat, the northern, the northern route that didn't exist or was supposed to exist? Is it super ultra north? Yeah, like it was supposed to be a northern okay. passage that from east to west. It, it was going around the Horn, and then it was going up above the Arctic. Circle. Yeah, it wouldn't be south. Right. It was the Cape of what? The Cape of Good Hope. <sighs> It was, it was sketchy, yeah. Um, so happy belated... Uh, South of America. Ha happy belated... Uh, uh, um, it's uh, a margarita delivery. 
Thank you, Nico Chan. You're such a doll. Nico Chan, what are you drinking this evening? Happy, happy belated Cinco de Mayo, by the way. Uh, yes. Wait a minute, dude. Mm. And to all y'all. And this, this is my first alkafied drink um, in two weeks. Because two weeks ago, I wasn't feeling so red hot. So I was just trying to clear my system out and see if, if I could figure out why I was such a worthless piece of crap. And um, none of that worked. And then finally, it, it all just went away. I just drank a lot of water. I just stayed away from heavy foods and all the crazy stuff and just like went salads and water and light meals and going to bed early and doing all that stuff and just trying to you know there's another way to do that right shoot heroin no oh. just come in here and turn this shit up well i was trying to do that but i didn't have any motivation to do it oh and um so you know, we had to we postponed the show last week because Joe had a gig, so he was out of town, and it was perfect timing because if he had not gone out of town, we probably wouldn't have been able to do the show anyway because I was completely out of focus. And um, and I, I some, somehow uh, somehow I got my groove back. How did I get my groove back? Well, I started just like I said, I started cleaning up my act a little bit, but also. Um, uh, Stone Temple Pilots came back to town after their first maiden run in Australia with their new rig, which is uh, a, a modified deliverance module in the Sin 2 preamp with the LXT power amp dun, 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 to replace dun, 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 his to replace his Demeter Pre and um, and the classic power amp. So um, I've been. I've been getting reports back from them, just like a photo or a text, but they were they were going crazy. I know shit here. Oh hell yeah, there. Yeah 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 yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and, but I didn't get a whole lot of detail until they came back and um, and Dean called me up and and uh, I missed the call, so. Uh, nice going, Steve. I called him right back, and uh, he answers, and he goes. Hold on, I got blue paper in my mouth. <laughs> and I lost it. I was just laughing my ass off. And, and he picks the phone back up and he goes, what's so funny? He was laughing too because I knew, think he knew what was funny about it. <laughs> and I said, I said I'm, I'm laughing, but I'm actually pissed because I wish I'd have been recording that. Right, right. And I said, tell me, if I had been able to record that, would you allow me to to post the audio on Insta, and he goes, absolutely. <laughs> so that was a missed opportunity. But uh, he called me to, to rave about not only how good it sounded and how good it felt and how relieved he was that he had new gear that was less expensive to ship around the world while mm. they're touring and the, the tone was right where, where he likes it and all that. But they've got the same, I've just found this out. They got the same sound guy that they've had for their entire career, their entire touring career. How Same do you dude. do that, man? I don't know how you do that. Wow. Wow. And he said, the way, that I, the, the way that I know that it's really dead nuts, bulletproof, right on, is the sound guy said, it sounds just as good as your previous rig, only maybe a little tiny better. <laughs> because I can tell you're having more fun playing it. And oh, that's, interesting. And that was the thing, the feel of it. It's just got a little bit... The, the Demeter has is, is always been kind of a dry... Talk about our ants being dry. That Demeter is dry. I mean, is that's it? just like uh, <gasps> sand in your throat dry. Uh, there's no compression. There's no bounce. And oh, that's it's, interesting. And it's kind of flat on top. And he's sort of always overcompensated that with other stuff, huh. um, like the presence on the power amp. Mm. Uh, and this time he doesn't do that, so now he has more flexibility tone-wise to get sort of more articulation and nice little things without having to dig in so hard, without having to work so hard. Huh. So he was just basically saying, I, I don't know when I've had so much fun playing live, and he's just like digging it. So that was a real nice boost to the ego that he went for that. So we built, really him, we built him two more duplicates of that rig for the U.S. portion of the tour, which we just finished a few days ago. And um, Joe's got a picture of that 
I um, do. That uh, they're getting ready to go. I think they're going to. I think they're leaving uh, the beginning of this coming week, and then um, so they're going to be out for a month. Look at so that. So that's his standard sort of setup with the two uh, JCM 800 412 cabs, the Vox in the middle, and the two LX2s and the two uh, Sin 2s with one deliverance module, one modified deliverance module in each one. So. The one rig is the main rig, and the other one is the backup if anything happens. So he's actually, at one time, he's only playing through one power amp and the preamp. And the delay that he's been using forever, I forget, which arcane old. It looks like, like I can't tell. Is it like an Intellifex or something? Exactly, that's what it is, yeah. yeah. I can't believe. And he doesn't want to switch from that because it's got these weird sounding sort of uh, you know, pitch, well, but, but, pitchy presets that he really did. Oh, yeah. But do you remember when you were talking about switching things in and out on your Esquire? And it was like, do one thing at a time. Like, let's oh, not yeah. go overboard. Bruce is like, you should do this and this and this oh, and this yeah. and this. And you were like, like maybe one thing. And then you went, okay, that worked. Like, maybe we'll do another thing. Like, And, and Bruce, by Bruce, he means God. Uh, DeLeo's guitar tech, Bruce, Bruce who Nelson. also makes Nelson guitars. Uh, so, anyhow, like, uh, that, that makes sense for Dean. Like, he's been using the same rig for two decades, plus three. Three. Yeah, they've been a band as long as we've been a company. Oh, all right. Well, then that makes my point even yeah. stronger. <laughs> so, the point being, you know, like... He doesn't want to change everything at once, mm -mm. you know. And actually, the Intellifex, you don't care anyway, because you ain't yeah. got nothing for him, man. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it's, he only uses a couple of presets on it. And, um, and the other thing that he, and he had in his rig was a MIDI octopus. Talk about an old school uh, <laughs> MIDI controller. Yeah. Um, but but he, was using the, he was using that to change presets on the delay and the octopus also had a remote switching jack to switch the channels on the Demeter preamp right right he didn't so he have MIDI. needed that that was the whole thing right. i remember when those midi switchers came out <gasps> he can do actually the, the analog yeah, right, switching at the right. same time so the new switcher now is the little just dope stupid synergy five button midi controller <laughs> The, the five presets that he that needs. That thing to, didn't work. Yeah, yeah. The first two didn't work. <laughs> you didn't hear that from me because I'm not one to gossip. <laughs> um, but uh, sorry. Uh, so got rid of all that stuff. That was another rack item that got to leave because now the MIDI is controlling both the the delay Delete. and and the and the and the module, the deliverance module, which all it's doing is the two the two channels. That's awesome. Yeah. So that's so awesome. Uh, he's got one set for a medium amount of gain, and then the other one is set for a little more than medium amount of gain. He's in, uh, not, he never uses really full blown. And then the uh, he's got so the two signals coming out of his pedal board going to no one signal going out of his pedal board going to the rack, uh, going to um, the system, and then to his two four twelve caps. And then a separate signal comes from a chorus, a boss chorus on the pedal board that goes to the input of the AC30. So, Interesting. Huh. So it's it's not like people say, he's oh, not, he uses he's the AC30 for the clean sound, but he's yeah. not really switching amps. It's a little but reinforcement it's for... A little sort of sparkly... What, little sparkly boxy action? Yeah, little, yeah, with a little chorusy box. action on it. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, and uh, so the boss chorus is only going to the that's AC30. Right. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Huh. Huh. So, what's it like listening to that rig in the room? It's almost like if you disconnected the Vox, you wouldn't even notice it was yeah, gone. Yeah, that's what I bet. Um, I th but they mic it. I, I, I pro it probably is more, um, more omnipresent in the in the front of house mix than on the stage because it's barely at any volume on stage that even that's even mm. of any consequence. I remember I had uh, to put my ear in front of him. Goes this thing on it, like, and so we, I turned the 
turn the standby switches off on the power amp, and then you hear this little <laughs> you know, Okay, yeah. that's what you're yeah. dragging this thing around the world for? Well, yeah, that's, you know, that's my thing. Like, that's okay. Funny. I wonder, I, I remember when uh, the DeLeo brothers produced uh, the second Alien Ant Farm record. And, uh, oh, what was his name? Shoot, I remember, uh, I forget the... I should remember the guitar player for Alien Ant Farm was talking about making that record and how the DeLeos were totally pushing him at the time to use small amps. Like that's what they recorded the whole record on, which is kind of interesting, you know, given what their sound had been, you know, which was kind of, you know, big sort of metal amps before that. Mm -hmm. But the, I think uh, the DeLeos were super into the small amp thing at the time and mm. so that's what they did the whole record on so I'm imagining the AC 30 is kind of like a holdover from that time period well I, he still records with little amps mm. yeah, he's in he's into the he, he he told me that he feels like the big amps take up too much space in a recording in, context in but a recording he uses context. the big he takes his bigger well bigger relatively speaking I mean well on a, on a stage yeah there yeah. aren't double track guitars you know and and other little parts right and right. you know so it's basically him playing in a more open environment and and uh, Robert is bearing down more you mm -hmm. know mm -hmm. so uh, they still try to keep it you know sort of open and unconstructed which what's is their nice. stage volume like um, well that's the thing that it's been de-escalating over time. That's it smart. used to be it used to be the classic power amp in full power mode with both the volumes at like two o'clock. Any Ooh. any any of you that have a Holy. classic or a twenty one fifty power amp with the volume controls at two o'clock, you know Holy good goddamn. You know what I'm talking about. You can't hear what I'm talking about because your hearing's gone. <laughs> he still wouldn't be able to hear. <laughs> but they play quite loud. And then he went to switching them to half power. And, uh, and now he's using the LX2 at roughly, you know, noon. That's like where it really starts to just come on. So now roughly. he's kind of like in, in the adult realm of managing his on stage volume. Well, he, what he said was he feels like now the LX2 behaves and feels more like the classic he used to because he was pushing the classic originally. Right. But when he went to half power, then he's got twice as much reserve energy in the power supply, so you don't, you don't push it into saturation anymore because it's got way more power headroom than you would ever need. So mm -hmm. it tends to sort of sterilize the sound a little bit. Right, right. Uh, even if you're pushing it, it gets compressed, but not output transformer compression. It's driver stage compression, which is it's a different animal. Mm. Uh, so now with the LX2 pushing it up to just the threshold of where it starts to get that gushy organic sort of vibe, mm -hmm. he says, like, I've got that feel back that I used to have when I played really loud, but my volume is literally a third of what it used to be on stage. So where is he at on this LX2? Right there, right about noon, noon-ish, noon okay. with, right. the, with the, uh, this, the, um, with this, this, the synergy, uh, the, the deliverance module volumes at around 12, 1 o'clock, and uh, the SIN2 main volume at Probably, I think he said he was at 11 or 12 o'clock, between 11 and 2, depending on the venue. Mm. And um, also, depending on the cabs, when they go overseas, they rent cabs. Mm. When they play in the U.S., they, he uses his own. Right. So right. Um, uh, when they went to Australia, they were using orange cabs. Oh. So he had to, he said he had to change the volume and really jack up the the the, 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 mid, the treble and the mid control on the deliverance module. Right. Because the... <laughs> The, the orange cabs were woofier on the yeah, bottom, right, and not snappy on the bottom, right. That's not so what they do. not big on the bottom in a good way. So he had lost some definition. But what they found was that they were able to manage that too using the depth button on the uh, on the LX2. That's interesting um, that you say it wasn't good on the bottom. It wasn't on the bottom. It wasn't big like in a good way. Do you always find that with those cabs? I haven't played through one in a long time, but I always kind of liked how 
they were down there. Are they sloppy? Well, um, I guess I'm thinking also the vintage. See, old, the, vintage, the vintage cabs didn't have vintage 30s in them. Mm. They had the 25 or 30 watt greenbacks. Mm. So uh, that's a different animal. And those cabs, the, those, the vintage cabs with those older speakers, those... Yeah, see that's because what because it gives that's it that I'm little extra of. girth, and that's why I'm thinking which huh. works for that. But the vintage '30s always, to me, have this sort of excessive low end, uncontrollable rumble. Yeah, I know, yeah, I know exactly which, what you're which talking about. Which in that cab then sort of gets aggravated. <laughs> I always feel like that's what informs that weird, uh, that mid range that never quite aligns harmonically. <laughs> that speaker. <laughs> but see that, and to me, uh -huh. that's the direct. <laughs> outgrowth of a company that's changed hands a few times uh -huh. they're owned by an entirely different entity and they've got some engineer hip engineer actually that they hired to to sort of oversee everything but um i don't know it's just finish shirt is popular all right we'll put vintage thirties in the speaker we'll sell them that way and blah 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 if it was me i would have modified the cab so that if they were really hell-bent use, on using vintage 30s, I would have tweaked the cab a little bit yeah, to help let's, manage that. But that isn't what make happens. Let's perform in, as a team, man. That, that isn't what happens yeah. in, 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 tr in companies that have transitioned four or five times. And right. that, those, little, those little subtle things, just, they just get lost or set by the wayside and forgotten about. And, um, Hey, uh, you know, I mean, that was what the whole Fane experiment was about. I never really wanted to use vintage 30s because of that. And people wanted to buy cabs with vintage 30s in them because they're vintage 30s. I like the sound of vintage 30s. Well, I like the mid-range sound of vintage 30s, too, but I don't like all the garbage that goes with it on the bottom end. Yeah. So um, I basically had an opportunity to show them that in real life, real action. Uh -huh. And so i'm not saying anything yet about if there's going to be a transition on calves but we're working on that oh and um you didn't i'm not one to gossip you didn't hear that from me no i didn't hey what's up john ziegler jay-z's in the house mr z um hey uh steve riff on this for a second discuss the difference between sin 5050 lx2 at some point interested in both now's the point Point, 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 counterpoint. Dramatic pointing at Joe, you ignorant slut. <laughs> <laughs> Jane Curtin? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Dan Aykroyd. Yes. <laughs> Good stuff. That you can't do live anymore. You just did. Crazy world we live in. Yeah. Um, yes. Very, in a nutshell, uh, the SIN 5050 was basically designed to accommodate the variety of different modules that would be available in the SIN, in the Synergy platform. The platform was still in development at the time that uh, the discussion of the power amp came along. The LX2 was already done. Okay. So... Uh, when they came to me and said, we need a power amp. And I said, you can't have mine. What do you want? <laughs> you know, what format do you want? And, and they were talking about a variation of the 252 and all of that. And, uh, but then when they saw the, the, the LX2, they kind of went, eh, maybe we want that. And yeah. I'm like, you know, I'll do a variation of that for you, but I won't do the variation that we're doing. That's that's ours mm -hmm. and uh but that was fine what they wanted was something that was really added or subtracted a lot more color and character mm -hmm. to accommodate the beha different behaviors of the modules that's partly logical if you're sitting there plugging in a module and going you know what this module needs and then you switch another one and then you go you know what this module needs and Every one of you knows that that's does it really make not, that sound. That's not what you do when you're playing. No, but yes, it does make that sound. Man, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I might track one down. Just yeah, for you next should time. do that. <laughs> so, uh, 
But that's that's the, that's part of the that's part of the dynamic of being on a design team where it's pretty much a committee, and people are throwing out ideas, and there's usually some some party pooper throwing <laughs> ice water on the concept. He's lobbing that, spit wads and y yeah. rabbit turds. Yeah, yeah, I'm the one. Just to so see the, if you the, can feel them. So I would get, a, I, when I was in junior high school, I'd get a straw, <laughs> and I'd take, we, uh, our homeroom was the, uh, the home ec class, so there were, there were. Home ec was homeroom? Yeah. Ooh. And so there were pin cushions everywhere with little straight <sighs> pins in them. And uh, so it's, I didn't just the devil's playground. I didn't just shoot spitwads through the straw. I put the spitwads with a pin on it oh and made a God. made a harpoon out of it. And boy, were those things deadly! Did. And, and as soon as that caught on, like a week later, you know that that sort of soundproof tile stuff that's on the ceiling. Yeah, it was wall to wall <laughs> spitwad harpoons. Like a hundred every square inch. Did you ever get busted? Uh, the teacher was just like, like I'm gonna pretend what's going on yeah. in there isn't happening. Anyway, um, yeah, I, I'm retiring in two years. Leave I'm, me alone. I'm like, yes, I get the concept, and well, you know, people are gonna be trying. Yes, I get the concept, but in the real world, you want the amplifier to be just more of an open palette rather than a specific palette that you shift. Because once you get a sound, then you play a whole song. You don't play this just one sound that you're experimenting with at that, that E chord or that D chord or that solo note that you're playing. Mm -hmm. You play a whole song. You play a whole composition with parts and stuff. So those really super precious settings become less precious as you go, oh, this now what I'm really playing you know, maybe I would like it to just, just sort of be more of a balanced palette to play, Dude. to perform with. So, yes. which is what yes. the LX2 is. So, but the the decision st stood that it needs to be more malleable and more adjustable. And to do that, that meant that the presence and depth controls have to be more active. Great. And we've discussed this before. The presence control and the depth control are a function of the feedback circuit in the power amp. Look at an old show uh, to, to, to see what we talked about there and, and get the explanation for that. But in really just simplistic terms, the more, the more active you want those controls to be, the more negative feedback you have to run through the amplifier. Hmm. I don't know if you said that to before. do that. Well, That's I did, but yeah. um, well, you know, know the guys that know a little bit about the like matchless and old AC thirties and stuff that had no feedback loops, mm -hmm. or guys that have had their amps modified to turn. Well, the feedback I was loops. that guy. I didn't know anything at all. Let's get in there and disconnect that because it's just connect the feedback loop. It makes crazy. it louder. It makes it hiss more. Yeah, it yeah. makes it more lively and open. But it also makes it flubbier and weirder. That's exactly and, what I found. Uh, yeah, I was so, doing that with my old fender. Right. So, but that's what the depth and presence controls are doing. So, uh, the problem is, it's only on the extremities, the high end and the low end, or mm. the high end and the low end, depending on if you're right is low or your left is low. This is like a little pantomime thing you're doing that's kind of cool. That's right. <laughs> and uh, so what the presence and depth control are doing there, they're raising the negative feedback at those extremities of the frequency range. Mm -hmm. What's happening to the middle? Nothing, because those controls aren't operating on the middle. So while the top and bottom are going like this with the presence and depth controls, the mid-range is staying here. And if you have too much feedback, now the mid-range is too stiff and never changes. Oh. So the amp isn't as organic and fluid sounding as it would be with a more, uh, a, a more conservative amount of, of uh, negative, feedback. negative feedback. So that's where the LX2 really departs from um, the SIN2. And also the, uh, the volume control, the single volume control. Um, they wanted separate controls so that you could control the channels individually. Well, great. But the presence and depth controls are dual gang. So the presence control, one pr presence control controls the presence on both. Same with the depth. So it wouldn't have six controls on the front. Sure. So 
then what's the argument for that the that the volume controls have to be separate if everything else is linked? And that was those were the kind of things that I would bring up and just people go, well, no, that's no, that's what we want. And I'm like, okay, great. The other thing is um, there was one more thing about the LX2, and that's the output transformers are made a little differently, um, and uh, so they they tend to be a little bit more. Um, they just they just are a, a, a more of a wider bandwidth output transformer. Okay. Yeah. And that coupled with the the less intrusive feedback uh -huh. and the depth and presence controls, which you can control separately for each channel, even though they're on those annoying little trim pots that everybody hates, but nobody really hates them because nobody, most people feel like they don't really have to mess with them. They just tweak them a little bit, and then you turn them on and off with the front panel switch, and you're done. And that's pretty much what everybody has discovered, yeah, that yeah. it works just fine that way. And overall, it's just a, it's just a more organic, um, less intrusive sonically, more, um, I don't know, it's just got a more, more air and um, sort of transparency, nicer sound stage. Yeah. There are very subtle differences. If you put them side by side, you have to, um, you, you, you have to spend a little time hearing what the differences are. So why does nobody make a mid-range feedback control? Well then what you're talking about is a bandpass control. In other words, a knob that turns the, the feedback entirely up and down. Okay? So if you turn that knob, because, because then, you wouldn't, then you would have to make a specific frequency filter, a bandpass filter for the mid-range, and now you're getting so tricky and special that the amplifier's job is to amplify and, and for the power amp to sound and feel and be responsive like, like a guitar amplifier. So it's fun to play. You start getting too, too precious with the control functionality and stuff, the, the, it starts getting more of a look at all the things I can do and I'm still not getting the sound that I like or enjoying as playing it as much as I would. Uh -huh, uh -huh. So, um, then if we don't get too tricky and just make a bandpass feedback uh, attenuator knob, then what happens is that if you turn the feedback down so there's less of it, then the presence and depth controls will not work as effectively. And you may like that, you may not, but then it's two more knobs on the front panel. Ah! Have you had that? I have. What do you think? Well, I haven't had it today. Yeah, but this is this is pretty strident, man. I'm just talking about stuff that you guys have no idea what the hell I'm talking about. This is a Willet Rye, and it's apparently a family estate bottled small batch rye, and um, oh, aged in white oak. That makes sense because it's like. White well, I would love to try it, but I don't have a glass, so I'm off the hook. <laughs> you you got it. It's, man. Maybe if a glass magically appeared, I might give it a shot. Yeah. I think no I pun saw, intended. I, I saw Nico-chan running around there. Um, I think. So, yeah, actually, more. good question, Mark Hamstra. Um, there's the answer. Oh, the glass genie. Nico, the glass Look genie. Now Look, you must reach Look at out. that. Thank you so much, you darling little thing. Nico chan I think you need a shot of this. That's good. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready? Get ready. Here, cheers. Cheers. Again. I don't find that strident. It was to me. I like it. I think it just sort of spreads out on the tongue and then does that nice sort of thing down the esophagus where it just. You know, it's funny just having this next sip. I would actually agree with you. When I first hit it, it was like it's been a while since I had a rye. And it was like. <laughs> you got ice. <laughs> and, I, and, and I was thinking, Bear, I was thinking, yeah, it is rye the lightning. It was. And it's cast, what is it, 54 
108 proof. So, you know. All right, Nikachan's going to... Yes! Yeah! I love this. What are you guys drinking? Uh, I think we, we don't talk about that much anymore, huh? Yeah, I guess we... Um, I, and I have to apologize. I'm like half asleep. I didn't get any sleep last night. Yeah, was... we're, we're, we, we've all been sort of like pushing ourselves to insane limits of, of, of whatever it is. Insane limits of, of yeah. endurance. endurance and Have you guys been doing that? Just pushing yourself for all it's worth. And, and why do we do that? Because that's how we stave off the exhaustion of dealing with all the insanity around us. So... Where's where's the only refuge from that? Putting your head down and just working your ass off and just like keeping the outside. I world love it. Out. I actually I love it. I love being busy, but um, it, it's not so great when you're on camera and you're supposed to be saying something worth listening to. Uh, Bear, that's interesting. So that that's that's it's that, that's not a Metallica thing, is it? Like somebody's just riffing hey, off that hey. though. Boom, boom. Cheers. That is nice. That is nice. Mm. Oh, cool. Gin and fresh grapefruit that fell today. Gin oh, and tonic. That nice, good. man. That sounds good. Very nice. And Kelly is rocking the water. Hey, Amen. Cheers to that. Not a thing like the black. You know what? Let's hear it for water. Yeah, water. Ah. Uh. I went through I went through a period where I just had no energy for about a week. Remember that I just like mm -hmm. couldn't get my act together, and, and then you drank some and water. And I talked to I talked to my doctor, and he and he said uh, he he said, "Do you drink water?" And I said, "Not a lot." He says, "You should be drinking some ridiculous like, amount, like eight gallons." Get a day with or it, something. Captain Kidney Stone. You're gonna be in trouble. Yeah, well, I did actually pass a kidney stone last year, so, uh, and I know what that all is all about. But yeah, I'm drinking a lot more water now, and I do feel a lot better. That's awesome. Um, but yeah, everybody I know, everybody I know, I, whoever I talk to, I talked to Friedman a couple of weeks ago. He's exhausted. I talked to, jeez, uh, I talked to, to Michael Thompson, guitar player Michael Thompson. Mm -hmm. He's just like, ah, same thing, man. I'm just like, Bleh! Um, <laughs> I don't think I could muster that. I just bleh. the the two the, the two things that that, that everybody in the two things that everybody I talk to tell me are that they're working themselves into a nervous breakdown or or they've gotten COVID and oh got, yeah and gotten over it. Yeah. So everybody I know, everybody, everybody I know has had it or just got it. Or just got over it, um, and I haven't. And well, we got to change that for you, man, because you got to be a part. Every, of the every club. time I start feeling a little bit weird, I get the test out. And nope, yeah. nope. It's almost like I'm disappointed. <laughs> I'm kind of being left out. <laughs> I want to be part of. I want to be like everybody else. Stout coffee. You got some ghost pepper whiskey. Ooh. Okay, so the funny thing about, well, it's not funny, but like when I read that, I think that's some dumb marketing bullshit. And then I go, I really want that badly. <laughs> Where did you get it? Like, who makes that? It's like ghost pepper infused whiskey, I'm assuming. That sounds really like something I need to try because I'm a ghost pepper fan. Um, Kelly B, same. Exhausted all the time. Yes. Drink. Try drinking a lot of water, like a gallon a day. Uh, you're going to be running to the can all the time, but it doesn't matter. Try it. See if it doesn't. Just see if it do, if it doesn't sort of sort of flush you out. I bet you it will. We got some Pendleton Midnight whiskey. It sure Fernando. worked for me. I don't know that. I never tried that. Um, well, uh, mint juleps, dude. That's awesome. I actually really like a mint julep. I haven't had one in a really long time. I, I appreciate them. Club soda, tequila. Wait, 
No, stout coffee saying it's ghost what ghost pepper infused tequila probably is what you're saying. Um, all right, let's answer this question here, and then let's talk about this stash behind us because we uh, said we were actually going to do that. Um, Uh, yeah. Yes, we are. Uh, rack mount kit for the GPDI and the power load uh, IR. Yes. Um, we were going to do it when the power load uh, was out. But uh, there wasn't a whole lot of demand for it. And we were going to do it when the GPDI IR was out. And there wasn't a lot of demand for it at that time. Those two products weren't running concurrently, so it there wasn't enough demand to go run a big production of developing that out. And plus, I'm trying to figure out a better way to do it. Um, it kind of bothers me that um, that these are designed to be this nice little desktop. You know packages. Yeah, yeah. That if you rack mount them, then they become these big two space rack wasters. Oh, right? yeah. And that yeah. bugs me. So I was trying to come up with something that would be a bracket system where you could put two side by side. But then does anybody do that? I don't know. So we're still kind of kicking that ball around. Does it make sense to come up with a bracket or just some simple stupid middle thing that's not? Uh, really overdone, like the like the rack mount kit on the power station. I mean, that's like it's a panel and a set of brackets yeah. and handles and all this. It's a very it's a it's a nice kit. Uh -huh. It's overkill for most applications, but it's a heavier product, so it needs a sturdy, sure, bulletproof kit. Yeah. Where the GPDI and the power load don't they don't weigh that much, so a simpler little less expensive just pair of brackets would mm -hmm. be great. Mm -hmm. So, uh, once I get over the OCD part of not make, not overbuilding it so that it's not some stupid $70 kit, right? You right. know, it right. should be 25 to 35, 40 bucks, shouldn't it? I mean, you really just want to manage it, you're not trying yeah. to. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, the power station has to be heavy duty. Because it's heavy duty. Because it's heavy. I don't well, want to drop that on my toe. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, see, that's what drives that's what that's what drives development around here. Somebody just asks a practical question. Yeah. What do you think about doing this? And if I start thinking about it, I go, okay, here's all the things that bug me about it. And here's all the, the things that I should be goal oriented about, and blah blah. blah. And eventually, it'll it'll start making sense. Well, we've got the next the next production run of power load IRs coming. Uh, in a few weeks, and then behind that, we're going to start seeing the prototype and then the final production of the GPDI IR. So now there will be the sort of like a concurrent production right. of two different products that yeah. use that bracket, yeah. and then we'll spend some time making a nice, efficient, little, not too terribly expensive bracket kit to go with it. And so that will materialize, you know very soon, and it will retrofit on the old GPDI and PLIR because that's what you would want it to do, right? Oh, nice. Well, because if I don't, why don't you make it so it fits the old one? Well, you know, I would get murdered. Well, so. well no, that's a good question. Yes, yeah. it should. So, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> that's awesome. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the question, everybody who have been asking them. Um, just eat slices of jalapeno behind, between your drinks or serrano peppers. Yeah. I, dude, that's awesome. See, any, I actually anything, want right now. Anything, anything works for me that's got pepper in it, whether it's a, a scorpion pepper daiquiri. <laughs> yeah, man. See, I wouldn't normally drink a daiquiri, but if it had pep scorpion peppers in it, see, then all of a sudden I'd be all about the scorpion. Well, yeah, pepper. yeah, because then that's, it's it's a little bit of a challenge. Yeah. Like step up. Yeah. Smart ass. Uh, we went to an Indian restaurant a couple of weeks ago. <sighs> Can we do that now? Yes, let's go. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> uh, down on, where was it? Was it on 3rd? 3rd Street? Down, uh, do you know what it's called? South of the Melrose. D 
district. It was called. Oh, uh, well, we'll figure it out. All right. Okay. I'll, Nikachan will find out what neighborhood the, was it in? the name of this place. It was down near Fairfax and Third. Oh, okay. All right. And the reason we went there is because we wanted to have Indian food, but we wanted to go to a place that had a full bar. <laughs> and it was the only place we could find. And uh, I called them and like, well, yeah, we think we can hold a table for you, but you better get down here right away because the place is filling up. We get there. There's nobody in there. <laughs> 10, 15 minutes. They said, 15 minutes? Okay, we'll try to hold it for you for 15 minutes. Did you we bust get, on them when you got there? We get there 15 minutes later, and there's nobody there. There's one guy sitting at a table, and I'm th I thought, well, maybe he's waiting for his food. And he kind of looks up at us, and he keeps kind of uh, looking down. Cook. And then he looked up at us again, and he finally gets up, and he comes, and he's like the mater d'. Dude. Like, he I went, makes us stand there for a sec before he sees us. <laughs> and then and then he goes, uh, he goes, okay, here's your table over here. Well, he never asked me my name. He never checked my reservation, which I did on the, you know, <laughs> on. Because you didn't need one. <laughs> Well, what was, was funny about bullshit. it was I just figured that he's that he expected us and saw the name there, so he just like went okay. But it was all a, such a farce, right? Here's the top. Here's the top part of the farce. About four hours later, I get a notification on my phone that that since I didn't show up to the restaurant, my my no, you lost your reservation. My reservation had <laughs> expired. <laughs> Oh, oh no. no! What a clown festival! But <laughs> the food was really, really good. Oh. And it's called Electric Karma. What? Electric and Karma. And they had a good, uh, well, jalapeno yeah. infused margarita that was hot, motherfucker! Oh. It was, it was hot. Nice. It was hot. It was hot, and it was great. Electric Karma. <laughs> Electric Karma. Uh, good food. I want to go. Good drinks. I want to go. Nice little atmosphere. Just like every other, what is it about? You, you wonder how Indian restaurants even survive because they, no matter what t time of day or night you go there, they're empty, and you this know, is just like that. Most of them are. Like I thought when you said that, I thought that's not true, and then I thought, yeah, yeah, actually, it's true. That's true. Every place, which is bizarre to me because it's one of my favorite things to eat. I always wonder what hour is this place. Jammed wall to wall that's paying yeah. the bills when, on it that I'm missing. When's happy hour? When's the coffee rush? Yeah. When's the whatever? <laughs> when, when do people come get their Malai Kofta? Um, yeah, that's funny. I, I was in uh, I was in a bar in the Arts District. The big news there was that they had a bottle of Port Ellen, which is it's it was a distillery on the Isle of Isla that ceased production in the early 80s. And it's like they're unobtainium. I've talked about the Tam O'Shanter here on the show before. And uh, they've had bottles of Port Allen at different times. And uh, <laughs> like, I've actually had a dram of that same basic uh, age, like later 20s. Yeah, I think it was 27 years old. And I, it's kind of embarrassing to say, but I paid 200 bucks each time for the dram and it was actually worth it to me it was that <laughs> well, good one of the rare times that something that's you know obscenely expensive it actually lives up to the you know the promised experience so anyway I was at this bar on tuesday night in the arts district and they had one of these bottles and they're really hard to get and uh, a dram there okay i paid 200 two bills this is Five hundred and eighty dollars from one poor. <laughs> I'm like, man, I got a bargain at the two bills. <laughs> Five hundred and eighty dollars. Oh my god. Huh? Anyway, yeah, that port. And actually, I heard that Port Ellen is coming back. Um, somebody bought the remains of the distillery, and they're building it out again, and they're going to have stuff. I mean, you know, it'll be age statement whiskey so you know you're probably looking at 10 years so and i think they started a couple years ago so maybe in about eight years we'll have some normal priced port mm. ellen to try again mm. but that that'll be fun that sounds interesting i yeah. just i was just noticing that, that there's an empty guitar stand over there so you didn't even pull out your guitar no i have a guitar right here it's just sitting on the floor what do you mean sitting on the floor i i'm i'm 
I built you out a nice little stand there Did to you? hang your guitar so it would but be here's, awesome. But here's the thing about me. is I'm sorry for overlooking that. Um, and we'll, we'll rectify that yeah, right please. now. I'll please. fix that. Okay. Show a little respect for your well, instrument, man. I never bring guitar stands what to gigs. What was that, that Mata line? Be man, that's your instrument. I felt so ashamed. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know this. <laughs> but it sounds cool. But I, I never... Uh, what is that? Is that my mic? Yeah. Oh, no. Sorry, it, guys. It's a jive mic cable. Sorry. It's kind of a microphonic mic cable. That's why you got to keep it inside your shirt. Well, I didn't have you to, like, put it behind there. Well, you're welcome to take a little um, intermission if okay. you'd like to rectify that at some point. All right. Maybe we will. Um, but, yeah, I just, I never bring guitar stands because I don't want to worry about more gear. Mm. I'm... Mm. Yeah, I'm that guy. <laughs> Just lean the guitar against. Well, the... I mean, for all the good it does you, I, I was, I was doing a show someplace. I think it was at the. Um, what was that place? The Ritz in New York. Oh yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty. It was a pretty big show, and I had. You played the Ritz. Two guitar stands. Yeah. That's cool. And. Um, it was a Dickies show. I played. We. It was. Uh, it was the Dickies and. Uh, Gun Club, and uh, um, it was a big turnout, and they had a photographer on stage, and he's running around, you know, taking pictures and stuff, and I had my guitar, as, I had my main guitar and my backup guitar and a stand, and the photographer kicked over my guitar that was on the stand, and I just gave him this look like, you're dead, you are dead, and he's, he did this, he had his camera and he did this, Sorry. Yeah. I thought I I, I wasn't going to hurt him, but I gave him a look like he was about to be decapitated, and I think he believed it because man, look at his face was great. Well, you know, I I think actually that's sort of what's in the back of my mind is like I just I remember the first time I put a nick into a guitar, and I think I audibly yelped, like it was a big deal to me. You put a neck like in. yeah. I remember I was I was um, I was trying to put another tremolo spring on you know on the spring claw of the back, yeah. and I had um, some needle nose pliers, and the spring slipped out, and I, <laughs> and I jabbed the back of my guitar. I was <gasps> oh, oh, oh. <gasps> you know mm. I was precious about it, <laughs> but in order to get over that, it was like okay from now on, I don't give a shit. Like, the stuff is going to get beat up. Mm. I can't help it. Even when I baby it, it just gets beat up. And so I just kind of all, sort of allow it to happen. And, you know, but people make fun of me all the time. They're like, your guitar is filthy, man. Your guitar is this. Your it's like, well, I just use it all the time. And I can't, I don't have time to be precious about it. <laughs> so, like, you know, um, who, who was saying it? Um, uh, uh, Outside, so, outside of mind. Um, yeah, um, build a guitar stand in the side of your cab, uh, BMO. Like, I, I don't, normally when I'm playing, I, I don't use big amps. I don't even bring cabs out normally. I, I'm a kind of a combo guy. So, you know, if I'm using a super reverb or whatever, I just set my guitar on top of the amp when I'm on set break or whatever. In the, in the early 90s, there were guys that were doing crazy stuff with, with amps, like that in Europe especially. Uh -huh. there, was, uh, there was a guy that had... A little sliding thing in the side of an amp that was a guitar stand. Yeah. That would hang on. Yeah. And then they actually had a. There was several guys that had little things like that. One of them had an ashtray. The other guy, the, the, it was a whole hardwood thing that he had built a case for. A, I think it was like a tweed basement or something like that. But it had this whole slide out thing <laughs> that was a bar. Had a bottle of whiskey, a couple of shot glasses, a, 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 a little thing for, of course, it was in, in, the, in the early 90s, of course, it would have a little thing for a bindle to put in there, you know, and then, uh, uh, you know, a, a swizzle stick and uh, a thing that hold a, held a pack of cigarettes and a pick stash and <laughs> like, oh my God, go out and play a gig. Jeez, you guys.
Well, yeah, and I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think some of it also indicates my lot in life <laughs> and like the my level life. of, you know, gigs that I do. Like, this isn't stuff where I have guitar techs available or anything like that. It's just me. And like, I want to get in and out as quickly as possible. And, you know, I don't want to be looking at my gear thinking, wow, how many multiples more is this gear worth than I'm <laughs> getting paid for this job? <laughs> stuff like that you know um so that's a pretty cool esquire you got there what are you playing through nothing right at the moment okay i just um um all i'm thinking right now is about the the monster rig back here because i spent so much time trying to get it right and um to my just endless amazement you know we've been saying that we're going to do this and we set up to sort of do it and then at the very last minute we go oh before we close we're going to pay five notes and see you next time and and um I, i've been thinking that well, that's really not fair we got to stop doing that so um so i did actually get over my sort of malaise about getting something put together that we could really show you something and play and have some fun and of course, once I started doing that, I had to go way, way, way overboard. Well, yeah. So let me say, before you dive deep into this, that when we were conceptualizing what this show would be about, it was what I actually put in the little promo stuff, like we're going to talk about maximizing your amplifier using the PLIR in the context of recording. But then... Um, Steve kind of built this and it's kind of become an entirely different thing. So I'm not quite sure where this is going to head this evening. We'll definitely talk about recording application and stuff and setting things up. But um, this is different than what I have at home. <laughs> <laughs> it isn't really. It's just... It's just uh, it's just more layers of it, but it's sure, sure. That's fair. It's that's the fair. same thing in that's essence, fair. That's which fair. is. But this this top this topic, if it's a topic, it's going to be wider, and maybe not wider as and deep. deeper. Oh, well, not wider, but not as deep. As, yeah, no, it's going to yeah, be wider yeah. and deeper and taller, oh, okay. and heavier, and cleaner and dirtier. I'm just I'm just I'm just <laughs> and more stereo more stereo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm too tired for this. Yeah, come on. <laughs> this will be the third show where you haven't got any fucking brains left. So now the I've third? Got, yeah. No, 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 my friend. Oh, I'm sorry, the fifth. <laughs> no, all of them. <laughs> all of them. Uh, so, uh, and, we, you know, um, I, I don't want the show to be like an advert. For our gear, right, right, right. Um, um, we we wanted it to be about look at the fun things that you can do with this stuff. How crazy Definitely. you could utilize it. Yeah, you know, it's it's got you know the power load has all these ins and outs. Uh, well, yeah, presumably because ten different people are going to use it ten different ways, mm -hmm. or one crazy person can use it ten different ways or ten different ways simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And th that's just the crazy way I think that, and we actually, that, that's, that whole mindset is supported by the, the customer support questions that we get constantly, which is, which is the, the what ifs. Right, that's, that's a lot of them, right? We call, we call that the interminable ifs. Okay, all right. There's like nonstop flurry of what ifs. And the thing is, is they're fun to experiment with and explore and see, well, what if? That's a good question. We hadn't thought about that. We try that. And then it, it, it eventually comes to the point where, okay, we're going to make a, a reactive load that's a recording tool. Mm -hmm. And uh, that will interface your amp to your DAW. All right? And now having... And then, and then as a result of kind of formatting what we're going to do on the show, show how we use it, I, I go buy a recording system, a DAW, and an interface, and figure out how they all work. And, and then I realize, 
there's a lot of different ways that different people create their own workflows. Right, right, right. And so if we're going to make this product to do this, at some point it's going to need to be able to do this, or somebody's going to yeah, be Yeah, you're to always it. talking about that. Yeah. I, I bump into that when, when Steve and I are talking a lot. It's always thinking ahead to, oh, yeah, well, if I don't do this, then somebody's going to ask for this. Okay, I better do that. It's a lot of that thinking. It becomes, right? yeah, it becomes, we start stepping through the scenarios, and then we go, if, you know, this idea begets the next uh, troubleshooting uh, episode, begets the next possibility, you know, question about a possibility of a configuration and stuff. And so within the parameters of the product and the price range that it's going to be in, how many of those questions can we answer without just going off the rails? And do then, you, and do so you, we sort of do pick you, and choose. Do you kind of have, when you're launching a product, do you kind of have this fantasy of like, maybe this time we won't get any of those kinds of questions. <laughs> like maybe we did it this time. Maybe there won't be any ifs. Ditch recording and play live, baby. No, we're gonna be playing live. Ditch recording and play, well, but I'm, you, the reason I mentioned the interface is because for the purposes of getting a really good sound live on the stream, I mean, you see demos, you see people using, recording demos and putting those online and they sound really good, but we have to play live and have it sound good out there. It has to sound just as good as somebody recording and uh, recording it, and then having the luxury of mastering and EQing and and doing all the putting all the fairy dust on it to make it sound. Well, but wonderful. the ditch recording and, and play live would you wouldn't need a PLIR then, just plug in the plug in amp and rip. But we're not going to be able to transmit that to the stream unless we mic. But that's what I'm saying. That's why my man here, that's why we're, we're doing a different thing. We're, <laughs> we're not playing live, we're talking about, you know, this is more of a recording environment. You're monitoring this stuff through the monitors. Yeah, but uh, it needs to be just as much fun as playing live. Oh, yeah, of course. And that's what, that's what all the effort is about, is, is getting it to the point where, where it would do that. So, uh, I, um, I took, I, I wanted to, just, I wanted to discuss a few things. I wanted to talk about Dean DeLeo's new rig, and I wanted to talk about using the power load, um, you know, playing around with it a little bit in a couple of different um, scenarios, like cranking a big head through it, using the, the GPDI through it, and, um, and then I wanted to interface that with uh, comparing that to the, the the Leo rig with the LX2, and then be able to switch the GPDI in place of the the, the Sin2 preamp, and show how that behavior is a little different because the the GPDI is actually a, a, a fully self-contained amplifier, not just a preamp, and and then uh, all of those things all simultaneously, so we can do them right here, right now. So that's what I did. I. I stacked up all of this stuff and connected it all together, <laughs> including behind me. There's an ultra lead up there turned on. That's connected to here too. So, <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to reveal that later. Oh, ah! no, I'm revealing it now. But okay. well, it'll all be right. a re it'll be another reveal later because when you hear how it all works, um, you'll be going like, really? <laughs> okay. So here's my question. You've got to explain it, but they've got to hear it too. All right. Uh, can we? Can you do all that while these mics are on? Uh, yes. That is the question. All right. Are you ready to reveal and, um, and, and, and revel? And okay. So what I'm going to do is, since you asked that question, uh -huh. I have to do this so that. That was the drum roll, Fernando. Sorry about that. I had the monitors turned on pretty hot. OK. So um, one, two, one, two, one, two. OK, we still have. You talk, Joe.
Hello, hello, hello. Test, yeah, test, right. test. Okay. okay, so we have vocals. We still have. Yeah, feedback. Screw hearing anyway. That's exactly right. I don't have any left. Um, so that's what I did. I still got the, the mics on, and I've got... Okay. Oh, sorry, JS. Dude, I'm sorry. What, did we blast somebody? Yeah, he said he had the ear pods in and he had to... <laughs> sorry. Oh, sorry, guys. Okay, so this is... Synergy Deliverance module into yeah, the TC 2290, uh -huh. into the LX2, into the power load IR. There's two power load IRs. Into two, okay. One so we for got each channel, and one of them is set with one kind of cab, and one of them is set for another kind of cab. So this is the Deliverance 412 cab, mic with an SM57. And this is the Sound City 412 cab that I believe is a 57 and a 121. Okay. And you're on the clean channel right now. So that's my really super setting. And what I'm so the the power amp is set at noon. So uh, yep. Um, crap, my. <laughs> uh, we won't do that again, JS. Okay, I, I got that under control now because I turned the mono the uh, monitor was down. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only laughing because at least at least I'm happy to know that the level is getting out there the way we wanted it to. So hopefully the hopefully it's it's clean sounding. Um, I have the um, I have the LX2 set to noon, mm -hmm. so it's right at the onset of clipping, right where it starts. But when you were showing it to me earlier, I thought it was interesting because I had Steve, like you know, playing a chord and stopping it so we could listen to the delay because I wanted to hear if there were any kind of you know saturation artifacts in the power section of the LX. Well, <laughs> Alex, it is a power section, um, and it wasn't. So, even though it's at noon, it's really clean. Still. Well, but it's just, it's because it's this kind of clean with with, with especially with this kind of guitar. If it was really super super clean, the the um, and, I, and I did this, then the um, it would be too spiky. Right. Because I've got the treble control all the way up. You'd have twink twink. Yeah. So the power amp is what's. S what's um, sanding off the top of it? Yeah, it's rounding the edges yeah, of the fretboard, the tonal fretboard. <laughs> so now I've got a preamp mm -hmm. driving a reverb. Mm -hmm going to two 50 watt power sections mm -hmm. running right up to the point where if you smack the strings enough they start to clip but they don't clip in a buzzy way no. they just they just do their little compression thing and yeah. smooth out the, the harmonics on the top then that is going through like the two calves that you described and then into uh, a mic pre and then into the dot so mm -hmm. The output of the uh, the output of the DAW is what's feeding the stream. So, basically, if you, I think um, I think somebody asked us um, earlier in the week uh, if we would talk about how to do a wet dry wet system with um, with the PLIR. So, I don't know that you would really want to need to do a a method to do a wet dry wet system in a DAW using the power loads, although you can. Uh, because in in a recording environment, you can 
you can set a left and a right and a dry center very easily just in the mix. Right. So you don't really need to set it all up in advance. But um, so if I if the, if I misunderstood the question, I apologize. But I thought, well, you know, I could actually sort of I could actually show that, and um, <clears throat> uh, but I don't think I will on this particular episode. But what I can do is show you the whole right-left scheme of the power amp using stereo effects part of it. Okay. And then if you want the center dry part, you take um, you take the dry out of the preamp, and you can run it directly into your DAW through um, an IR. Sure. And get a nice dry sound that way. Yeah, so totally. It's so... They're yeah. easy to do. You just commit to another track, and, and it's right then, right there. You don't oh, have yeah. to do anything tricky. Right. So, no, there's nothing. Tr there, there's, it's not like oh, here's a weird workaround kind of thing. Right. All of that stuff's on the back, right. readily available. Right. Do you want to run? Uh, you want to get? May I? Uh, yeah. So I'm gonna do this. Okay. So we are changing channels on the deliverance module now. To the high gain channel, which is the top one. And I've got it in the less mode. Um, Pull out your double neck. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Well, the beauty of that is that I'm still using the same guitar, and I've got I've got an overdrive sound that's pretty manageable. Yeah, but you're not even in full-on flamethrower mode yet. I'm not. But what's important is that it's got the edge of breakup sound without again without being too brittle. Well, to me, you could eat, this could even be clean if you just roll off your volume. You know, you kind of have two channels right there, right? Yes, that's right. Um, and then uh, what I was going to say about that is Right now, we're at the point... Needs more cowbell. If that's all it needs, I'm good with that. Uh, we're at the point now where, okay, what if we just want to refine the sound a little bit? We don't even have to play with the tone controls there. Mm -hmm. We can just do this. Or this. So now, just by switching the calves, you know, I've gone into a completely different territory with the same guitar, with the same gain settings, with the same power amp, saturation, and all that. All we did just was just switch calves. Right. When you're using uh, an IR loader in your DAW, and you're faced with the, pro the prospect of fishing through... 50 cabs to find. I hate you know, doing right. that. Yeah. That is aggravating and it's and it's and it's inspiration killing. Yeah. And it's all that. Want to go take a nap. Yeah, so if I put this back where it was and I just want to have a little bit more edge on the oh, sound. Oh shit. I don't have to go hunt for another speaker cabinet. I just put my edge on the sound. And you asked earlier about, you know, about getting a little bit more depth. You could do it that way. Well, yeah, and we should talk about that. 
firing up the ultra lead. Right. So the the real beauty of of having a basic IR loader in a separate box with a really good load that you can tweak the top and bottom and behavior of it is it's just a snap. It's right there with having having two selected cabs on presets. And the way this works is you've probably seen some of the demos, but the way it works is you select through whatever cab you want to use, and every time you switch, you'll hear the sound of the different cab. So you're basically just scrolling through all the cabs, and whatever light is blinking, that's the cab that you're listening to at that time. It isn't until you select the cab that it becomes a preset, right? So I just, just temporarily started playing through this cab combination. But then I want to go back to what I had, I just hit the button and I'm back to what I had. At the same time, I may have selected another preset that I liked as well as this one, but wanted as an alternate. So I saved that as a preset by holding the button down for three seconds. And so I have two uh, on-demand presets that once you write those, they stay there no matter if you power the unit down and turn it on later. Uh, or, or whatever, it memorizes those two until you change them. And then wh whatever you change them to, that's the next presets that you have the next time you power the unit down or turn it back on. So it just makes, um, on, a give, on any given session, it just makes it really easy to just, okay, this is where I was at, but I wanted to try this. Oh, that's right, those two I pick, picked out for this track, this is the ones I like the best. But you know what? If I just try this for a sec, and now I really like this one. Okay, I'm done with that. That's, um, uh, that's just the simplicity aspect of... That is my favorite thing. Yeah, it's my it's... favorite thing too, because first of all, and we talked about this before with the, when we had... Um, when, Nielsen? When, when we had Nielsen on the show, the philosophy behind the cabs, not just that there are cabs on our speakers that we that we did, that we captured for the IRs, yeah. but we captured them in a specific way for them to just uh, have the best essence of the speakers and the cab behavior that are in them without making them too sort of mic specific, too honky, too angled, too bright, too dark, too whatever. We went There's nothing for, funky about any We of went them. for really wide open, usable presets and if you want a honky celestian sound you can drop in your own you can do it in a DAW whatever the purpose of this is workflow a good open sounding speaker that works for a lot of different sound settings simultaneously with subtle different adjustments of microphones and angles that are still open and workable and nice sounding and balanced that you can just switch to and you don't have to drive yourself crazy trying to screw up your workflow finding something. Right, so it, that's, right. it's all about the workflow. And of course, the analog cab part of it is the same uh, deal, but we're not going to get into the analog cabs today. We're just going to kind of play around with how all these things are all configured together to work like this. But I, I'll be talking about the analog cab stuff uh, very soon in video stuff. So we'll, we'll get into that. I thought we'd talk about that a little bit more today, but um, we'll we'll save that. We can if you want, but I just think that there's well, so much other interesting stuff. To before you move on, Oh, that's I'm, right. I'm gonna flick this. Oh, the, the one thing that we haven't done yet is Ready? Um, no, uh, is um, go to the more mode on the deliverance module. So yeah. this is deliverance module more mode into LX2 uh, using the 2290 in stereo. But first, bang out a couple chords before we launch. <laughs>
Just, I'm done. Well, I'm. Uh... So at the end there, you were actually playing through. Uh, both uh, the, just two ether cabs <laughs> with the ribbon mic. <laughs> I just want to be able to say that when you're in drop D, like raging. Yeah, well, that's, that's really funny because when we made the GPDI, mm -hmm. Paige Hamilton came down uh -huh. and we recorded him doing uh, meantime, the meantime riff. And, and one of the things that the GPDI can do is it can spit out just the raw performance. Yeah. And we put that on a separate tape. Uh huh. And then we made a demo of it playing him through the ether clean with tremolo on it. Oh, that's hysterical. And it not only was this hysterical, but when I played it for Paige, he goes, "That's awesome. What is that?" And I go, "That's you playing through a clean tremolo amp." And he's like, "What amp is that?" I says, "The ether. You played it through it before." He goes. Oh, you I remember with playing that. through that. I don't remember it sounding like that. <laughs> Dude. So, I mean, <laughs> that that's that's fun. Yeah, well that that's really 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 killing right there. I do think that's killing. Uh, do you want before you move on, do you want to play another guitar through it? Why don't you play another? Or do we want to go Yeah, I don't know how you want to do Here, it. Here, why don't you put your you're less Paul. Oh, that. okay. All right. Um. I don't even know if this guitar is in tune. <laughs> Okay, so um, you want to keep the same high gain setting? Uh, you can just steer me through it and have me do whatever you want. I would like to hear it through the monitors a little bit. So I'm gonna, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna switch to where we have the mics off so you can hear you through the monitors. I'm gonna play through some stuff. And then I'll switch to having the mics on in a minute. Okay.
Okay. Steve on the buttons. Steve on the buttons. Yeah, babe. Yeah. Um, so play, play just a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So um, one of the things I did while you were playing, mm -hmm. besides switching around, I, I turned the reactive load up to full brightness and full depth and down and up and switching between cabinets and stuff. But one of the other things I did was I turned just towards the end, I turned the LX2 down so to get it out of its maximum clipping region yeah, a little yeah. bit uh -huh. to clean it up, uh -huh. which would also give a little bit clearer detail on the low end. Mm -hmm. And then I compensated by turning the levels up on each channel out oh, of the PLIR so that the level would stay the same, but the clarity would come up. Mm. So that's one of the things I was experimenting with earlier is using the same preset, the same reverb, the same basic level structure set up, but just trying it with the LX2 cranked enough to where it's compressing, right. and then backed off enough to where it's not. Yeah, and but that um, whole thing, it was different when you're using an Esquire versus a humbucker. Left well, no, but you could really hear it here, too. You yeah. could really hear that the, 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 those, those kind of pickups, the, hum, you know, the, uh, the humbuckers have this upper mid-range squawk, and you could hear totally. that come through more clearly when the amplifier was cleaner. Mm -hmm. But then if the amplifier is dirtier, they wouldn't squawk so much, but it would it, it contribute to the sustain a little more. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. So somebody, um, well, one of you guys asked to um, do the GPDI now. Okay, let's do the GPDI. Do so the what GPDI. I can do is the same rig, but instead of the... Um, in, in, instead of the preamp, the, the Synergy preamp, we're going to use the GPDI. So, Which, gonna, let's say it again, the GPDI is in itself an entire amplifier. It's right. not just a preamp like the Deliverance uh, Synergy module. So there's, got, there's, there's more going on in there. There's actually a, a tube power section in there. That's right. Um, the only thing is, okay, that's good. Um, you're only going to hear the GP, you know what I'm going to do? I'm just going to do the whole switcheroo. Okay. Switcheroo And then, and then we'll talk about what that is in a minute. Okay. Switcheroo is being dialed in. I don't know what the switcheroo is. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, 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 dun. Okay, that's but um, while, while it's intermission time, mm -hmm. would you guys like to discuss the little birdies on the, uh, <laughs> the the trees we have in the background? I walked in today and I thought those were pretty cool. It kind of looks like um, what I say, like Christmas in paradise. It yeah, almost looked like yeah. Christmas ornaments or something. Yeah, that was just a, a little embellishment. That was Nico Chan's little embellishment of the of the vibe here. Nice. So, um, did switcheroo happen? Yeah, let's hit, now let's see if does that that should have just taken care of itself. There's that. Look, keep playing that. Keep playing that. Uh, we have a little. Um, keep doing that for a sec. I was gonna put the, I was gonna put the LX2 into the power amp, right? Uh, no. Okay. No. I mean, not the 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 GPT GP3 into the power amp. 
Uh, no. Okay. Anyway, scratch all that. Here's what I did. Okay. I switched it out now that the GPDI is going into the left. The uh, what is it? Left or right? <laughs> oh. <laughs> this power load, and I've got an ultra lead back there. The ultra lead is on, and that's going into this power load. Whoa! So, that's the big reveal to me. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the routing there. Now, and you'll notice the guitar is plugged into right. the GPDI. Right. So, the guitar is going into the GPDI, and those of you who know what the GPDI is and how it works know that it's got a unity gain tube buffered direct out on the back. Mm -hmm. um, that's a copy of the signal that's going in, except it's low impedance. So you can run that direct to the board if you want to have a save track that you don't record anything on. It's just your draw, raw drive performance off the guitar. Mm -hmm. That is going to the input of the ultra lead. So just by plugging into the GPDI, you're plugging into the GPDI and sending a copy of that signal to the input of the ultra lead for it to do its own amplification thing. But, but you have a special piece of gear. Well, in line. yeah, because sure we don't get because what's going on here is we've got the LX2, the SIN2, the the TC, two power loads, three power loads, <laughs> and a GPDI plugged into the in into tree. the mic pre interface, right, and the head plugged into power, plugged into all that. There's <laughs> a good eight paths to ground here. And have you noticed that there's no hum? There's no hum. And there wasn't with the Esquire, more importantly. Right. Which, right. That should have been. Uh, outside a little pickup noise, there is no ground loop hum here because, the, um, because all the ground loop functions on the various products work really well, number one. And number two, we've got, uh, I'm using XLR outputs to connect to the interface which helps, and then the last step is I'm using a, um, an ISO transformer, kind of like this, just a little simple one-to-one in, in -one unity gain isolation transformer to isolate the input ground Between, of the head, which yeah. is plugged into a different outlet than all of this stuff is. So it should be humming like a bitch, and it's not, and it's because of that. The nice thing about the GPDI's direct out not only is it a copy of the in, it's at unity gain, it doesn't affect the tone, but it's also at low impedance, which works especially well with an isolation transformer. So plugging your guitar directly into one of these can sometimes play little games with the, the interaction between the pickup and the inductance of the transformer that's in one of these devices. So depending on which device you buy, some of them will sound more transparent, some of them will sound less transparent when you have a, a low impedance buffer in, in the equation, that prevents the pickup from being uh, affected by the behavior of the transformer because there's no direct connection between the two. So that's what's going on there. That's what keeps the ultra lead. And the ultra lead is, in, is in, the, in the rhythm channel in more mode. So it's got a lot of gain. If it was gonna hum and buzz and freak out, it'd be doing it now. So we've got all of that stuff connected simultaneously. Dude! And it's not humming. So when we go when I when and we I go miss. back to talk about workflow, you know, and we get people going, you know, I want to be able to use these different things, and can you recommend some kind of switcher so I can switch between things? Well, if you organize it carefully and use the equipment to its full capability, you can just plug it all in together, and then run a few outputs to channels, and then you can mute. Channel one, channel two, channel three, you can just mute the ones that you don't want to hear and turn on the ones that you do want to hear without having to worry that there's like some, you know, alien freak out signals going through the thing that are making right. it impossible for you to do that. And while we're sitting here, I did not turn my volumes down. I'm sitting, the guitar is wide open. Yeah. Yeah. And nobody's saying that it's, you know. Uh, where's the ISO transformer connected to? It's between that copy out of the GPDI and the front end of the ultra lead. And uh, I think Steve will show you right now. I don't know if, so, if it's clear So here's the curly cable. The purple curly cable is going to a little, uh, 
just like I showed you a little ISO transformer, that is being fed by the direct out, that's direct out one of the GPDI, which is feeding the input here. It is also feeding this uh, power load and the LX2 and the two, uh, well, you don't hear that. So we're coming out of the GPDI into the ultra lead. This is the speaker output from the ultra lead that's laying on top of a bunch of AC cables down here. <laughs> Dude, it's just a recipe for... <laughs> and going yeah. into the amp in of this power load, which should have some ground interaction with this one because they're both connected by XLRs to the same interface which has a common ground over there, but because they're, because they're balanced connections, they don't cause a ground interference problem. Um, and also, those two unbalanced lines are also laying on top of a pile of AC cables down here. I should take a picture of it so you can see it. It's a total rat's nest, but I did all that because I wanted, it, I wanted to see if I could make it all work without spending four days dressing cables and laying them out and making sure that they're all going to be behaving and work right and sound clean through the stream. So I think we successfully pulled that off. Hey, um, let me see that box. Which box? Is that this? Yeah. Okay. Because we have a request. All right. Um, I'm going to pull this whole thing over and everyone can laugh. So, friends oh, oh, oh. and family. That's that's actually it's that, that's actually not a converse, kind of a, a commercially available product. But is but that one behind? It's the same one. I'm, it's it's the same one, but you can show it. I mean, you know, you might be able to get them from Bradshaw. That was, it's upside down. Yeah, that that was one uh, a, that I got from Bradshaw Custom Audio. I don't know, <laughs> thirty years ago. Uh, it, it, and there's nothing really super special about it. It's not a, it's, there are probably, there are probably ISO boxes out, like Lele, for example, that are probably better as far as devices that you would plug your guitar directly into. Um, That's interesting. We should know, um, we could do a little research and find out what the best one is to recommend for that thing because. Our friends are asking for um, diagrams for this kind of thing. We've got some interest here. So if people are interested in that, they probably want to know like what the best product is for that particular application. Well, um, if you go to the manual <laughs> of the PLIR. We can't read, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> if, we, if you go to the manual for the PLIR, you'll see recommended uh, setups in there that show the, the subsets of these. And no, no sane person is going to... No, that's, that's properly stated. No sane person is going to set up a rig like this in their home studio. Uh, although, I highly recommend it if you, <laughs> if you just want to get work done. Um, uh, but I don't want to be so presumptuous to say, hey, go out and buy three power loads and two GPDIs. I don't you think know. anybody here would not be into having three somebody <laughs> somebody today sent uh, posted uh, an Instagram photo of their studio their 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 man cave basically mm -hmm. <laughs> and the guy had there were no less than four power stations the guy had like, walls of amps and and like his four favorite amps he had a power station on each one of them wow. with a, with an effect pedal sta sitting on top of it plugged into its loop so each amp had its own power station with its own dedicated delay pedal or whatever it was using for that it was a there was a, 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 a matchless and a two rock and a Marshall and a this and a that, huh. a Mesa Boogie and something else. Wow. Uh, and um, that's, uh, that's admirable. It's, it's also like really, sorry, but it, it makes me think like how lazy. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to like, I, well, I just, I could, just four and then I don't have to move. You know, after I put this all together yesterday and I got to, I got to say, I had more fun screwing around with it and switching things back and forth with not, not having to, the one thing I did not do is go, 
Uh, I'd like to try that, but that means I would have to get off my duff and go unplug something and plug in something else. I didn't feel that because it was right there, bing, boom. And um, Well, you know who has the most brilliant setup in the universe is Tim Pierce. Yeah. Because it really is like the He's got his little version. crazy cockpit. He's yeah. surrounded by... Like the he's... heads are there if you want to tweak them, but he can switch between them. Like he, it's all, you know, it's minimal standing up and plugging crap in. Yeah. Like the, th the only thing he has to stand up and get is guitars. I want to use this guitar and then plug in, then everything's switchable and he's just ready to go. And, you know, the cabinets are isolated down in the garage, you know. But I know he, he knocks stuff down with... Yeah, yeah, he uses the power station. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's well. He's got a cabinet that's down in a in a in a. It's in a box that was built in his garage. Yeah, yeah. So he's got that, but he that's and, he, has, he, and, he, he, and Pete, he and Pete both are using the power station now because they realize that they can get the sound out of the cabinet without beating the crap out of their favorite cabinet that, that they use all the time. So it's, it gives the... It, Isn't Tim into those super old speakers now, too? He probably wants uh, to... You know what? He's, he started doing that, but he still uses his old, old, old VHD 412 for the... Yeah, that's what thing. I thought. That's one of the cabs in his ISO box. Yeah, because I think it just... It's just a matter of, hey, it's set up, it works, and... Um, it was funny, I remember when I was over there, I was like, oh, okay, so those are the cabs you have. What speakers do you have in the cab? He's like, uh, I don't really remember. <laughs> okay, a, a, little, a, little, a little insight into how I operate. Um, I didn't bring out the 2290 just to, just to show off, you know. I, I hereby confess, I, bought, I brought the 290 out because um, with this two space rack case, I could put these two devices in, and then with this rack case, I could put the P the the PS2 in it, which I want to hook up with the GPDI to go into one of the the PLIRs for an experiment, and I'll do that in a minute. And then I was going to put one of the reverbs on it, but. Um, that I was just going to put a power station and the GPD and the power the, and the power loads and the GPD stack them all up. But two power loads wide are wider than than a power station. So I put the I I put the power station in a rack case so that I could put these on top of the rack. And once I did that, I realized oh, I can put. I can use the 2290 as a as a delay instead of using the usual delay box, which would not fit on the top of that because it's in the way. So the 2290 is here is because the power loads fit perfectly on top of them. <laughs> and it looks really cool. And it looks really cool. And, and hey, but I, it sounds really, really great. You know what? It's I been a long time since I've heard one in person. It's been a long time since I've played it, and I actually had to spend a half an hour remembering how how to set up my favorite presets, uh. and and I was and, and hooking it up to the interface to check it with the stream, and I kept hearing these phase stuff, and I went, oh, that's right, that's right, I had to do this. Oh, oh, that's, oh, oh that's right, I have them pan differently. That's why I have them pan hard and left and right, because anybody that has ever played with the 2290 knows that the way it achieves stereo, it has this funny little phasing. You I've know. never owned one, so I don't know, I've just heard um, them in bits and The delays, pieces. The, 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 the dry signal is in phase on both channels, but the delays are 180 degrees out of phase. Right. Uh, which is what gives it that real spatial yeah. thing when the when there's multiple delays. It's also how it does ping ponging. So that means to get the best performance out of it, you have to pan it. You have to use both channels and pan them hard left and right in the interface, which is what I did. So well, once I, I did in. that, once I remembered, oh right, I got to pan. So once I panned them, then all of a sudden that big, huge, spacious 2290 delay came back, and I went. Oh yeah. Well, uh, nothing else on the planet does that. What I what I really dig about it. <laughs> that's funny because I was going to say, I use a Strymon, a Dig or Dig, I don't know what. Uh -huh. Probably Dig. Uh, because it runs two delay lines in one pedal, 
Right. And you can set them at the golden ratio so that the way they overlap, it really blurs the line between, like, is it a delay or is it a verb? Like, I can't really tell. Uh -huh. And the 2290 does a really, really, really great job of that. I mean, you know, when you stop, you can hear the repeats and go, okay, that's a de uh, delay, but, um, you know. It's got that space rather than just, like, that dry echo uh -huh. grossness that uh -huh. I can't stand. Okay, so now dry what I'm doing... Grossness. Now what I'm doing, going back to the LX2. Are we playing the Les Paul now still? Does it matter? Um... Let's, let's do the gold top. Or Strat would be good for this. Cool. Yeah, let's use a Strat. Um, so I'm going out of the GPDI now. Do you like that? Yeah. Yeah, 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 I love that. I don't know if the guys with the in-ears like it, but... <laughs> um, so out of that, into the 2290, out of the 2290, in, into the LX2. And then into the two... Powalos. So to do that, I need to take this out. So there. That was a cool sound. So uh, yeah, I still have everything all connected together. Um, I just took the ultra lead out of the equation, and now we're just using the GPDI as the. Uh, Go ahead. Just the GPDI. GPDI into the 2290 into the LX2. compressing in a really nice way right there. I turned the LX2 up so that it would compress more and I turned the gain down on the GPDI so it wouldn't mud out on the bottom. Oh man, I wish everybody could play that because the experience is really, really, really um, where it's at. <laughs> yeah, single coil hub, totally.
This is a, um, it's a 1999 R4 um, that I snagged one day when I walked into a guitar center. It just happened. In 1993. Oh, how'd you do that? I'm going to turn the mics off for a sec so I can turn this up in here.
Okay, sorry for, I hate guitar playing. Sorry it's for, no fun. Sorry for grudge fucking your guitar, but it's <laughs> way too much fun. <laughs> when you were playing, when you went into the heartbreaker thing, your, your eyebrows. My eyes were like, I know I'm gonna fuck this up. <laughs> it was like, it was totally like, you ready? You ready? You ready for me watch to fuck this, this up? Ready? Watch, yeah. watch me, watch me step on a rake. <laughs> Totally. <laughs> and fall down a flight of stairs I exactly, simultaneously. I knew what that look meant. It was like, oh, yeah, here we go. Yeah, here we go. Here we, here we don't go. <laughs> I, I honestly don't have any uh, any calluses yet. I, I haven't, my, my resurging calluses have not come back. Anybody notice my detective t shirt? Um, there was a band in the 70s called Detective. Um, they were the first band to be signed to. Um, Swan Song Records, and they were supposed to be... Detective was Michael DeBar. Yeah, Michael DeBar is um, formerly from Silverhead, and, um, uh, uh, and, and Michael Monarch on guitar, and John Hyde on drums, who's a longtime good buddy of mine. We still play together off and on. And um, uh, uh, purportedly, they were going to be produced by Jimmy Page, and then he got busy and couldn't finish the project, and somebody else finished it or something like that. So, he was doing some Crowley uh, rituals or yeah, some shit. Yeah, there was all kinds of crazy stuff going on. But um, uh, I just got together with, with John, the drummer, a, a week ago to get my calluses. Oh, look at this special to get my delivery. calluses back. And uh, he said, asked me what T-shirt size I, I wore. And I said... Uh, you know, I gave him the size, and he gave me the. He he said they're re-releasing this. Wow! So it's been like what the fiftieth anniversary of the of the first Detective album. That's crazy. And uh, so um, let's see if we can get this on there. So these are my boys. This is uh, look how snazzy. Yeah, this is uh, Michael Monarch right there. There's John Hyde on drums. This is. Uh, this is Michael DeBaris. This is uh, uh, what's his name, the keyboard player from Yes, and uh, and the the bass player Bobby, uh, really great bass player. Um, let me get their names right here because I don't want to be a total douche. Um, where is that? Uh, uh, Tony K and Bobby Pickett, bass player. So um, so they he gave me he Bunch gave me a T-shirt because they're they're re-releasing the record and they had a little. 
party a week ago and and uh, who all showed up? Uh, just those guys and some other people from. But like everybody his, on the record. Yeah, showed up. How cool is yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. And you know, Michael DeBarres does a show on uh, Sirius XM. I didn't know that. And um, huh. he's on. Uh, I think he does it. Yeah, he does. Um, he does a show on uh, Underground Garage. Okay. So he pulls out all the obscure crazy stuff from you know like the small faces mm -hmm. and you know that that uh, late 60s early 70s you know rod stewart uh humble pie small faces all the bands and he was one of those guys that were sort of coalescing and creating this new crop of well, what's funny is bands. I, I know of that band i know who he is i know kind of their history a little bit but i've never heard them i don't know what that sounds like yeah, well, they're an interesting amalgam of all the the the, the bands that were going on at the time. Uh, the uh, Debaris has a bit of the um, 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 yeah, Tony K is cool. Um, 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 Steve Marriott sort of oh, yeah, vibe, yeah. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And uh, and Hyde is was really a big bottom freak, big cat. <laughs> In fact, he got in a God. he got in an argument with the engineer, uh, recording the first record. Okay. He got in a big fist fight with the guy. Okay, what what year did they record that? That was seventy two or seventy two or three, I think. Huh. Okay. And, um, I had an idea, but it went out the window. Uh, what was the argument about? Oh, uh, this was released. This record was released in seventy seven. Okay. All right. So John probably wants the. When the levee breaks, drums like everybody and their mother wanted. Yeah, so and the producer's like, "No, we're gonna have dry late '70s drums." Right. So John sets his kit up, and he's really fanatic freak about the set. It, it's got to be set up just right. All everything has to be in the exact perfect place, and they have to be tuned a certain way. He gets it all set up, and the engineer comes out. All right, and he starts taping the drums. Yeah, right. And John's going, "No, no, 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 no. There's not going to be any taping on the drums." And the engineer's going, "Oh no, there's going to be tape on the drums." And John's going, "Oh no, there's not." Right. So big argument ensues, and they don't get anywhere. So they decide that they're all going to go out and have lunch, and they'll come back. Well, when they come back, all the drums are taped. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And John starts ripping off all the tape. Oh. And then a big embroglio uh, ensues, and uh, eventually it all got worked out. John's drums weren't taped. Who produced that record? Uh, who has actually produced that? And who engineered it? Let's let's dig. Okay, well the engineer would be the guy that went a few rounds. It was produced by Andy Johns in Detective. It was supposed to be produced by Jimmy Page, but Andy Johns apparently took over. Uh, uh, assistant gets... engineers Doug Ryder, John Henning, Denny King, Andy Zane, Pete That's Carlson. so interesting because Andy Johns has presided over some ridiculous, yeah. some of the most ridiculous drum. Yeah, so I think it was time. one of the assistant engineers that got into it with John. It was really hilarious. He apparently, apparently after all that, and they recorded the drums the way John wanted, and then the guy started getting all kinds of work from people that wanted to get John's drums. John's drum sound on no that kidding. record, yeah. Huh. So he won out at the end of that. So that was his last. Anyway, I want to hear that. So we get together. Uh, we try to get together, and it's been really crazy since COVID, and we haven't been able to get together. So I don't have any calluses, but I'm starting. To, we got together last week. I played until I could not play. See my calluses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had bloody blisters yeah, yeah, yeah. last week. I I, I played Barely until I couldn't bend a string anymore, and. Um, but I have been practicing, as maybe a couple of you hopefully noticed, and um, <laughs> practi practicing playing a lot faster and sloppier than I usually do. That's rock and roll. Yeah. Uh, is there any, what, what else can we should, did you say something that you wanted me to hook up a certain way? Uh, do you guys have any questions about what you'd like to, yeah. uh, how things are, are connected and uh, what you would like to see uh, happening with the, the rig? We're at about two and a half hours in. Uh, two, two twelve. Two twelve. Two twelve. Two hours and twelve minutes. Oh, two hours and twelve minutes. Twenty nine seconds. Uh, I can't see the screen that well. I think I need some new glasses, or we need to fix the screen I so I can glasses. see. So I'm I can see the comments a little better. I normally have it set up so I can see them over here, but even that isn't that that good. 
Um, reading the manual, I think I'm good. Oh, that's nice to see. Thank you. Uh, Stephen Sawell, you are very, very kind. I, I'm humbled, and I appreciate that. Uh, Your practicing's paying off, man. Uh, well, it's not paying off yet, but... Um, uh, well, it paid off in a couple. So, um, Kelly says, let's hear the ultra lead. So you want to, uh, that sounds to me like he's saying, let's hear the ultra lead by itself, not mixed with the other amp. And right. we can plug that into this dual stereo setup. Which makes sense, because we didn't do that. Because, you know why we can do that? Because this whole rat's nest is all connected together in such a way that it will do that. It's funny when you walk behind there, you're like, oh, furnace. It is a furnace back here. It's yeah. unbelievable. <laughs> and so what I have to do to accomplish that is actually use two, <laughs> two power loads. Oh, you know what? I got even a better idea. The ultra lead will come out. This is the ultra lead speaker output. That will go into this poor, lonely little power station PS2 that's been just waiting for something to do. And it's been on the whole time. It's been on the whole time, so it's nice and crispy uh -huh, in there, uh -huh. comfy and warm. Mm -hmm. So that's going into there. Now, to get out of that into the 2290, is come on brain you can do it mine can't we need to get out of the and then and then and then and then power station into uh, the, uh kelly since you suggested it you pick the guitar that that's a good idea through. we have the esquire we have the p90 gold top we have the humbucker les paul and we have the 50s custom shop strap. Good night, friends who are bailing. Thanks for hanging, man. Okay, what's going to be the easiest way to do Steve, this? Steve, do you have a hamster wheel in your, uh, in your head? Because Amanda says she likes to watch the hamster turn the wheel in your brain. Yeah, that's exactly what's going on. Thank you, Amanda. You're totally right. Uh, okay. And then, Kelly, you said Lester. Which Lester, buddy? We've got two of them here. Your pick. Humbucker or P90? You have to come out of that. Pick your poison. Into. Yeah, that's going to Okay, nice Humbucker, Les Paul. Uh, oh. Well, that's Stevens. Um, this has to go. Okay, all right. Right. It's unanimous. That's going into here. <laughs> That's going to be kind of a hot level, but we'll make it work. I don't know if you can hear that, Amanda, but the hamster's whispering behind this stuff. So I think we need probably the Les Paul for this. No, that's what they wanted. That's, that's what the votes confirmed. Okay, I'm going to have to probably tweak the level a little bit. Yeah, it's pretty hot. Yeah, baby. That's a good sound. That's an excellent sound. This is how high you play your guitar? Depends.
<laughs> Go ahead. What is this? Wait, 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 wait. What? What is this? Look at this. There's, oh. a, there's this thick layer of dust on the headstock. <laughs> That's right. That's oh right. Oh my God. <laughs> oh man. Um, are, are vocal mics on? Should be. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, so I, some people have said that it's causing some squeal, but um, definitely the guitar itself and the. Which sitting transfer. right in front of the power load, which yeah. um, Natch will do that. <laughs> Playing drunken Motley Crue. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right, so I have. <laughs> Where did that come from? So the Ultra Lead is going into the uh, into the PS2, which is in bypass mode and no speaker connected to it, which means it's just operating as a load. The line out of so it's got a reactive load. We've got oh, you know what? Do that again. I'm gonna kick up the. What am I go. playing? Same thing. There we go. A bit more down. So, um, so I have the uh, uh, the Ultra Lead plugged into the PS2A as a load only. The line out going into the 2290, 2290 stereo outs into the LX2, and turned up just at the onset of the saturation, out into the two power loads into the mix into the stream. So I was just diddling around with the uh, the voicing switches on the power load and the voicing switches on the PS2A because so now we have three loads that we can screw around with and you know all the calves whichever ones in each one just so just that are so many hundreds of combinations of what you can make the ultra lead do I 
I mean, thing? yeah, and if, and if I spend a few minutes, I will be able to get the GPDI to sound just like that. So, see, what I'm really kind of, what my goal here is without using presets, without using modelers, without using deep layers of, of computer functionality, you know, the, 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 the page after page after page of functions and page after page after page of cabinets to get to a sound, just instant access, use your ears to hear. You can, you can actually hear, you can hear out there. We have the monitor turned way down so that they don't feedback with the mics. Yeah, we can barely hear our, unfortunately. But what you can sound. hear is the onset of power amp distortion in the LX2 when I turn it up and turn it down. How you hear it is the top end clarity increases and the bottom end um, kind of opens up and, and, and loses its thumpiness. Uh, it, it just becomes more of, of note value. Right. As I turn the power amp up to where it starts to compress, you hear it start to compress. Notice I said you hear it start to compress. You feel it start to compress. Oh, huge. So just having the access to the controls and being aware that you're, you're listening to what you're doing, and I just need a little bit more of something. What is it something you just think about? What is the little something I need to just put the icing on this cake? Mm -hmm. A little compression, a little, it's a little spitty on top, turn the power amp up. That'll get erase the spittiness or right. turn the, right. the reactive load brightness down mm -hmm. or switch to a cab and a combination of those other two things. There's so many subtle layers right. of salt and pepper that you can add or extract right. just in a couple of seconds without going, what was that preset? And, 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 and not at deafening volumes where you're like, I can't even, like, your you, ears you, don't you, get worn down. Yeah, you can you've sit lost here and your, do all of that yeah. tweaking. You've lost your perspective. Y yeah. You get that, you take a photograph. Remember that? Remember that? Yeah, you'd be yeah. out in the room, okay, go back in the control room. Uh, you know, after 20 minutes, you're like, I And of course, break. when you go in the control room, the thing that you hear out of the monitors is entirely different than the thing that you hear. Yeah, in the you're morning. always yeah. readjusting. Yeah. Now you can sit there right in front of your monitors right. and do this. And stuff. Then once you get it where you like it, you take your iPhone out, take a picture of it. Those are, those are the settings. Right. I do that all the time. Yeah. My phone's full yeah. of that shit. Yeah. Um, That's my instant recall. It just seems like time's been flying, but we've been having so much fun. Hopefully, <laughs> uh, uh, hopefully you guys are enjoying this. It seems like you're you're hanging out, so you must be, or yeah. or you're insane. Well, uh, um, I'm sure. Which I'm sure is probably high probability. A little bit of that too. Yeah, because we are. Yeah. <sighs> well, um, yeah. actually, I feel like we accomplished quite a lot. We actually made everything work, and we did what we wanted to try to do, and showed this sort of insane level of interconnecting things together, and actually have them behave. And, and and not give us any problems. That was fun. Yeah. Um, Steve you know, got to see how dusty my headstock is. Yeah. <laughs> That's embarrassing, dude. You got to do something about that. But I won't. Like all my guitars are like that. I just don't. What well, I I do when I make time for it, but I just don't. Mm. I don't. See. I'm, I'm bitching at him about cleaning his headstock, and I'm <laughs> the one that's got five-year-old sets of strings on my guitar. So it's all where. You, it's all where you place the value of the of You know, the, when, when, I was, when I was 21, 22, and I didn't have anything going on, and I was just practicing six hours a day and doing whatever gigs I could and teaching lessons, like, dude, I, I would change my pickups all the time. I'd change <laughs> my strings three times a week. I, you know, I had time to do that, mm. you know? <laughs> That's the thing. Dusty Headstock is my new stage name. Okay. <laughs> Who said that? Oh, of course. I'm in. <laughs> and with that, let's get the hell out of here. Yeah, let's get out of here on a, on a high note. What do we want to play going on? Uh, a high note. A, a high note? All yeah. right. Then, you know what? You're going to play the high note, and then I'm going to end the broadcast. You ready? You got the high note. That's a high note. Okay. That is a high note. Later on, guys. Later on. Now, high note. Highest note. Hold it. <laughs>